Okay, we are live now. Eh, bien, eh, buen día, bienvenidos, bienvenidas, eh, buenos días, bienvenidos, eh, welcome everyone. So today is a pleasure having with us uh, John Larsen, that is uh, is an expert on um, the search of uh, micrometeorites all around the world. And uh, he has managed uh, to bring uh, pieces of uh, other worlds uh, from the very, very uh, small uh, micrometric scale uh, sizes. Uh, he comes from the University of Oslo and he will also um, start a, a particular the interesting uh, phase. Uh, we have this uh, citizen science uh, project that is associated with this uh, recovery of meteorites. We have uh, in the, the entire Spain, uh, also Ban Balearic Island and uh, Canary Islands covered by uh, cameras. That is, uh, this project uh, has more than 27 years uh, of age right now. Um, we are really enthusiastic because we got a lot of friends also among uh, amateurs astronomers that are, have been contributing all over these uh, 27 years in uh, recording the sky and giving a, a scientific explanation to this process and today with leon that is just uh, my side soon in the screen um, we will introduce in a new uh, phase uh, of this uh, uh, citizen science uh, project in which uh, we also uh, bet for uh, searching micrometeorites in uh, your roofs. So uh, hopefully uh, can give us uh, a lot of uh, information to, to do this uh, in a scientific and of course this effort can bring us to new discoveries on the, uh, the, well, the arrival of these uh, particles from the entire cosmos. So welcome, John. Thank you, John. Take my, my place. So I will sit down and um, I'll try to do my best. Uh, my name is John Larson, as he said. Um, this lecture is uh, two parts. The first part is the history of the discovery of the cosmic dust particles uh, in urban areas. The second part is a description of the finding, descriptions of the stones with new pictures. You will be among the first in the world to see new pictures in color, high resolution of cosmic dust particles. So, um, but in, in general, what this uh, whole project is about is like all science, we must never forget that everything is not discovered. There are still a lot left to discover. Everything is not invented. We are not at the end of history. So, and sometimes a new discovery may lie literally on the table right in front of us, barely camouflaged by our own habitual thinking. So my advice is to think outside of the box so to speak, and now I'll try to change the picture here. Let me see how that is done. Um, this is not uh, what I expected. So we have to invent, make our creativity to uh, change the image here. Um, I don't know, it doesn't work. This is what I love about lecturing. <laughs> nothing works. So, um, remote control. Uh, no. No. I can assure you, we have 47 more uh, uh, photos to show you, but it's hidden inside here. Uh, okay. I mean, on the here. Yeah. Okay. 
my uh, background is uh, mineralogy, geology, and um, in the summer of 2009, that's 14 years ago, I was having uh, breakfast out in the open at home. Uh, I cleaned the white table and sat down with a fresh basket of fresas and was just about to eat the strawberries when I discovered right beside the strawberries on the table, which I just cleaned, something had appeared. A little small dot, shiny, and I picked it up on my finger. Let me see if we, this works. Picked it up on my finger, and with my background from geology, I could feel, wow, this is a small rock. This is not a part of an insect. This is not a plant seed. It's a small rock and it hadn't been there uh, a few minutes earlier. So now I wonder, what is this? A small rock suddenly appearing on my breakfast table. So I started Googling. Uh, of course, I knew about uh, meteorites, but I wondered, could meteorites be very, very small? So I Googled and found uh, a recent uh, publication by Matthew Genge, from Imperial College in London. It was called The Classification of Micrometeorites. So I started reading the same day. And before I knew it, I was completely hooked about this mystery. Because in the literature about micrometeorites, it was obvious um, uh, a problem. It was the micrometeorites were discovered 150 years ago in ocean sediments by the um, uh, Challenger expedition 150 years ago. Um, this, is, this image is from the Natural History Museum in London where the original samples from the Challenger expedition uh, are kept. And since then, th they discovered out in the open sea, they found small rounded melt droplets and they, just used a pure um, logical thinking and they realized these particles must have fallen up from above from the sky this must be cosmic spherules this was a mystery nobody knew was cosmic what cosmic spherules were but soon after many other scientists started to search for cosmic dust and micrometeorites but didn't find them so this was a big mystery for, for many years. Uh, many people search for micrometeorites, but everything, all we found was industrial products, small melt droplets from power tools, from uh, industry and anthropogenic uh, contamination. So this is just, um, of course, you are uh, rocket science, uh, but here is a short reminder about our solar system. We have the sun in the center with the gravitational pull. And between Mars and Jupiter, we have the asteroid belt. That is one of the most frequently used explanations of the origin of the cosmic dust particles. But also outside of Neptune, we have the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, which may also give particles that drift inwards towards the sun may end up in the zodiacal cloud, dust cloud, and some of it may accidentally fall down on Earth. The big question is, is it possible to find it? By the way, we also know if some of you might, uh, may recognize this uh, um, illustration of an object from out side of our solar system entering our solar system uh, a few years ago. So, and the year after, uh, a new big uh, comet left also from outside our solar system, left a dust trail after itself. Some of that will fall into the sun. Some of it may actually fall down upon Earth. So the origin of the micrometeorites may be from all dust producing objects in 
and outside our solar system. So we can actually see the cosmic dust. And this is an image that some of you may have uh, encountered. It's, it is called the zodiacal light. It is um, an accumulation of dust particles in the, um, in the same plane as the planets. And you, we can see it immediately after sunset or before sunrise as a triangular shaped uh, light. And most people uh, who have observed this, they may think, oh, this is, these are the, the first rays of the sun or the, of the day, but it's actually, we are looking out in space. These are the sun rays lightening up on cosmic dust particles out in the zodiacal cloud. And of course, most of this will fall into the sun, but some of it also attracted by Earth's gravitation and may be retrieved on Earth. So the big question is, how can we find it? So for the last uh, 150 years, there has been a lot of scientists, more than 1,000 scientists have tried to find the cosmic dust particles. And it was only in the um, 1960s, Donald Brownlee, the American scientist uh, discovered some aerosol particles in the stratosphere. They were called the Brownlee particles. Later, we found out that it was uh, interplanetary dust particles. Uh, a few years later, uh, French scientist uh, Michel Moret, he wanted to go to the Antarctica, uh, where he thought the cosmic dust particles may be preserved in the ice. So he went there and he found the first uh, populations of cosmic dust particles of micrometeorites on Earth. So Antarctica has been the reference place to go to study cosmic dust particles since um, Michel Moret's uh, uh, discovery. In this picture, there is a um, contemporary scientist from uh, South Korea. Uh, he is searching for cosmic dust particles and he is dressed in this uh, clean suit, not to keep warm, but to not give away particles from himself to be confused with a clean environment in the Antarctica. So they are finding micrometeorites in the uh, Antarctic snow and ice due to the continuous high pressure and the very extremely clean environment in Antarctica. But it's very expensive to organize for expeditions both out in space to collect cosmic dust and also even to Antarctica. It costs hundreds of thousands of euro and it's very hard to come by for researchers. So the big question for at least 100 years has been, is it possible to find micrometeorites in populated areas, which are most places on Earth, of course, it would be much, much easier if we could just go walk out on the street and pick up uh, cosmic dust particles there. But the question, the, I mean, the answer to this question has been no, this is not possible. Uh, six years ago, if you asked NASA, if you asked Joseph, if you asked any scientist in the world about is it possible to find micrometeorites in populated areas, they would all say the same. This is not possible. And why? It's not possible because of the anthropogenic uh, contaminants. Wherever there are people, wherever there are human activity, there are small particles left from us, from our activities, especially from uh, industrial activities. So, but I had already felt this small particle on my breakfast table, and I thought, hmm, I might well uh, give it a try. And I read the scientific publications uh, up to this year, 2009. It was not much, three centimeters of com publication combined of cosmic dust, micrometeorites, etc. So I read it all, and 
uh, it could be summed up to one. The micrometeorites, the micrometeorites are smaller than two millimeters. It didn't say any more specific than that, but they are smaller than two millimeters. If they are larger, they will burn up in the atmosphere. And two, they are mainly constitute, constituted by uh, iron oxides, the two minerals, vistite and magnetite. Um, vistite, I didn't know, but magnetite, of course, I knew from before. It's the most magnetic of all natural occurring minerals. So I went to the hardware store, bought a magnet. You can see it's up in the left corner. And I just put it in plastic bag and started to take dust samples from my neighborhood, from the small road around my house. Later, I thought it would be more efficient to go to larger roads, more uh, accumulating areas, larger areas. So I started to take uh, dust samples with my magnet every day. And I knew that they were smaller than two, two millimeters. So I thought, okay, from zero to two millimeters, I look somewhere in the middle. I look for round metallic spheres of one millimeter size. So I got these two, see, one, one and a half millimeter, one 0 0.4 millimeter. <clears throat> and I thought, what's falling through the, the first one and what's staying in the last, in the fine mesh would be particles between 0 0.4 and 1.5 millimeters probably where I would find the micrometeorite. So I started uh, collecting tech samples. I also uh, established a journal with uh, each time I took a dust sample on the road or a parking lot. I gave it a date and a number and starting to observe what was in the dust sample with my microscope. It's an old size microscope. I've had it for 30 years and it's fantastic. It may last for uh, 100 years. Anyway, later I will show you, this was a big mistake. I had completely gone wrong when it came to the size. I didn't know that. So I just started sampling, observing and writing everything into my journal. So I took sample from roofs, roads, everywhere. And at this time I had uh, I am a freelancer, so at this time I still had a job playing jazz guitar. Uh, I was a touring musician, so which means uh, I was traveling a lot. Uh, within five, six years, I had been in 50 different countries, and everywhere, every time we stopped for a cup of coffee or a cigarette, I took dust samples on the ground. So I, within six, seven years, I had taken approximately 1,000 dust samples from all possible different environments, from dense uh, city centers to rural areas, from farming land, from beaches, from bare mountains, and in 50 different countries, from Malaysia to Brazil, United States, everywhere, even in Spain. And I found a lot of things. Everything was noted into my journal, but I still did not know what they were. But after seven years, I started to recognize the most frequently occurring spherules in the dust everywhere. So this is the new word, word for today, spherules. Spherule is a melting droplet that has solidified in, in the shape of a, a sphere. And, um, of course, uh, the sphere is nature's brilliant solution for maximum volume with minimal surface. So it's the surface tension in a semi-liquid or liquid state that creates the spherules. So the micrometeorites we are looking for, they are igneous spherules. They are melted uh, cosmic dust particles due to their flash heating during atmospheric entry, but also the industrial particles are melted spherules. So what you see in this picture are, I would say the average spherule content of one 
teaspoon of dust from anywhere in the world. This could be on the road outside of uh, ICE, uh, uh, this building, or it could be in the center of Barcelona, or it could be in New York. Or you, what you can see is a lot of different colors, textures, some metallic spherules, uh, some glossy spherules. The big question, what is what? And if anything, is some of this extraterrestrial? I didn't know, but I gradually learn to identify each of these types and after seven years i had realized that the spiral population of the world is not infinite it is a limited amount of reoccurring frequently occurring types let's say it's 80 different types uh, constituting 80 percent of the dust on the uh, on earth so I started to identify these 80 types. So what we see here, these are four different man-made types of spherules. These are from power tool, it's from plywood work, it's from asphalt production and also roof covering with asphalt glue. And these are from mineral wool used for insulation in all temperate and cold areas of the world. Glassy spherules, very similar to the description of the micrometeorites uh, from Antarctica. But these are man-made. There are also uh, naturally occurring spherules. Uh, nature use prefer this brilliant solution of maximum volume with minimal surface. So up to the right are iberulites, uh, clay uh, or the fine dust particle <laughs> spherules from Sahara. Uh, blowing by wind over the south uh, region of Spain, and also some pisolites. It's uh, a creation um, shaped in fresh water. And down here are turgorites. It's from lightning, melting light, uh, rock by lightning. And these are from volcanoes, so-called acnelite. So there are three things in nature that can melt rock. It's volcanoes, and it's lightning, and it's meteorites. So only three things. If you find on Mars a melted rock, it has to be one of those three solutions because there are no human activity there thus far. It will be. Nevertheless, still I had not found, this was in 2015, I had not found one extraterrestrial particle, but I had spent seven years uh, identifying at, uh, and classifying the dust of the world. So I was the one in the world who knew the most about contamination. So, but one day, um, actually just two meters away from the white table where I found the first particle in 2009, I was cleaning the rain gutter just above my head. And in there was this particle. It did not resemble anything I had seen before. This is different. I took it to, uh, by then, this was in 2015, I had already established a um, connection with the University of Bergen in Norway, and I had access to the to the SEM uh, electron microscope. So this is a backscatter SEM image where you can see a very distinct stripy texture. I'd, I was not aware of this, but I showed it to my mentor at that time, Dr. Matthew Genge at Imperial College in London, and he just looked at it and he said, there it is. This is a micrometeorite. It shouldn't be possible, but this is a micrometeorite. No doubt. He had studied the Antarctic collections for years, the interiors. He realized that this is what they look like when they are fresh. Nobody knew at that time. So. Uh, I was very happy, but also very confused because this was not supposed to be possible. When I started in 2009, I immediately uh, reached out to take contact with the other dust researchers in the world. It's two in at NASA, two in India, uh, one in London, there was one in Italy, a handful of people who were um, studying cosmic dust. And they all said the same, no, no, this is not possible. So just forget it, don't waste your time, do something better. So, but here it was, the proof 
uh, that it oh it it was possible. By the way, Matthew Genge, when he looked at it, he said he said congratulations. This is the world's first fresh micrometeorite, but it's also the last one because nobody can be so lucky twice in a lifetime to find two micrometeorites. No, not possible. No, sir. So, but then it then it was too late. Now in 2015, I finally knew what to look for, and it was not round metal balls of one millimeter that I uh, had looked for, searched for. No, this one was only one third of a millimeter, and it's not completely spherical, it's elongated. It's actually aerodynamic, and it's not a metal ball at all. It's a small rock. It's a stripy olivine structure, magnesium silicate. So I had to search for different types of objects, and when now I knew what to look for, I found them immediately. So this, this is just an illustration to show the difference between the heavily weathered Antarctic reference collection micrometeorite to the li uh, right side. And I've just uh, put in the collage of the same type of micrometeorite to the left with an intact fresh surface structures. They are possible to identify and to recognize, um, not the Antarctic ones. They had to be molded into resin, polished halfway down, you know, and analyzed under the uh, electron microscope. So this was a new, um, uh, new information that nobody had before, what micrometeorites look for. And when I knew what to search for, I found it immediately. So that first summer, 2015, I found 500 micrometeorites because I just did the same, a search in, not on roads like I'd been before, but started to search in rain gutters on roofs and there they, were, there they are. So, but not only did I found 500, but they were also 500 different. The second one I found was slightly different from the first. The third one was slightly different from the two others. And with time, I had found 500 very different stones. And this morphology is not documented in the literature. This is not uh, photographed, is not analyzed, is not described in, pub in scientific uh, publications. So I realized I, this has to be documented somehow and preferably in in photo, you know, in light uh, photography, because it appeared that contrary to the established publications about micrometeorites, which are based on electron microscope, uh, which have no uh, information about color, no information about translucency. So in the, uh, in the literature, there were no information about the, the range of colors, of micrometeorites, fresh micrometeorites, no, nothing about translucent, uh, translucency, about glassy areas with metal spheres inside, not described at all. So I uh, got in contact with a mineralogist in Norway called Jan Thiele. He's, you see his belly here. <laughs> and uh, we have de developed an instrument for high resolution photography of micrometeorites. So when we come to the second part of uh, my lecture, uh, this, this is what you see here is the instrument that we use for documentation. It gives, um, with time we have developed uh, a magnification um, up to 3000, even up to 10,000 times magnification in high resolution color. So that's, uh, then you can zoom in to see details on the surface of the cosmic dust particles. So we'll get to that in the second half of the lecture. But in, in short, uh, what you see here, these are illustrations from the, from the classical uh, literature about um, micrometeorites. It's um, from the electron microscope, it's halfway polished down and we see the inner structures. These are significant and these are actually enough to identify other micrometeorites when they are polished, but it's not enough. You cannot see here 
what micrometeorites actually look like. So to do that, I have made a new collage here with the same type of micrometeorites in the next picture with color photography. So pay attention now. This is what it looked like before. And this is what it looks like in color, in color photography. So as you can see, th this is something completely different. These are recognizable uh, structures, textures, a morphology that has not been documented before. You are among the first people in the world to see them. And we are now going to um, look into this um, uh, with a systematic classification of micrometeorites. But first, a little bit of info about, uh, you know, they are so different. And why are they so different? Uh, chemically, they are very homogeneous. They are uh, chondritic bulk chemistry. It's magnesium silicate with traces of calcium, aluminum, and uh, iron, perhaps some traces of uh, platinum, actually. But why are they so different in visual appearance if they are chemically uh, identical? So the hypothesis at the moment is that it's all connected to the effect of heating during atmospheric entry. But first, let's look at what is the amounts of these cosmic dust particles. It's estimated that approximately 100 metric tons of uh, cosmic dust is falling into Earth every day. 100 metric tons. That's, that's approximately three large truckloads of sand. Uh, I would say that 99.99% .99 of this is cosmic dust. The rest are the meteorites summed up uh, on a whole year. In one year, it's supposed, it's estimated around 36,000 metric tons of uh, cosmic dust falling into Earth's atmosphere. How much of this uh, survives, we don't know. There are estimates from between four metric tons per day up to 30 metric tons per day that may survive. It remains to be found out. It's, so many things in the studies of cosmic dust that should be investigated further. This is one of them. We don't know where they come from. We don't know how much there is of them. So we are just scratching the surface uh, in this new uh, field of uh, research. So they are not only chemically uh, homogeneous, they are also very homogeneous in size. The little one to the left, the green one, is the average size of micrometeorites. They are mainly between 0.2 millimeters and 0.4, between 200 to 400 microns. That's the average micrometeorite, cosmic spherule. The largest one I found, I find five of those, are the one to the right. It's a super giant. It's almost one millimeter. So you might feel it if it hit your eye. <laughs> so, but most of them, uh, like 99% are in the average size. And why? Well, it's because that's the uh, window. That's the possibility. Uh, if they are larger, they will burn, they will have uh, l uh, larger momentum, large, uh, penetrate deeper into the atmosphere, exposed to more um, frictional heat, in the atmosphere and they will burn up. So uh, if they are smaller, they might even enter Earth's atmosphere at all or just ricochet out in back into space or stay uh, floating in the atmosphere as aerosols. So what then is the hypothesis about the different uh, visual appearance of the micrometeorites? It's mainly an effect of heating. Uh, if a micrometeorite enter Earth's atmosphere at a steep angle, it may achieve a maximum of temperature in, friction, in the frictional heat, the flash heating upon atmospheric entry. It might be 2000 degrees Celsius or even above. If it's above, it will evaporate. 
just become a part of Earth's atmosphere. But if it's beneath approximately 2000 degrees Celsius, it might survive. But then all the metals uh, would have evaporated and the remaining material is, is a completely melted micrometeorite, a glass sphero. So that's, and down at the opposite side, we see on the, at the bottom, bottom of this illustration, it's supposed to be the earth uh, swirling around in the center. <laughs> Some particles may enter at a very low angle at in, to, into Earth's atmosphere and perhaps even ricochet out and have a grazing incident. At the second or third uh, uh, approach, it might enter with a slow deceleration into Earth, fall like a leaf in the autumn, and uh, end up as an unmelted micrometeorite, unmelted cosmic dust particle. And these we will um, look at in a moment. They are very exciting because they have preserved some of the organic molecules from space. So this is another picture of the same um, mechanisms, the effect of heating. Up to the, to the left are the completely melted ones. And you can see as the top peak temperature is gradually going down to to zero, or at least beneath 1,350 degrees zero, uh, Celsius. That's the solidus, that's the melting point of the silicates. So beneath that, they will end up as unmelted micrometeorites. And between them are the six uh, characteristic types of micrometeorites. At the top, we have the glass ones. We call them the V-type, vitreous. And then you have the cryptocrystalline. They are recrystallized, but they are very small uh, olivine crystals. And then with a lower temperature in the number three there, you have the barred olivine. They've had uh, somewhere around 1,800 degrees Celsius as a peak temperature. And beneath that, you have the porphyritic olivine. And then you have the scoriaceous. They have not melted completely, just briefly started degassing. And then at the end, at the bottom right, you have the unmelted micrometeorites. These uh, types, by the way, are also the types of, uh, of con uh, chondrules, but they are different. I have not gone specifically into this in this lecture to compare uh, the chondrule types with the micrometeorite types, but there is a hypothesis that a part of the micrometeorites may actually be loose chondrules or fragments of ordinary chondrites falling into Earth. But we don't know for sure. This is only a hypothesis. So now we will start with the second half of the, of the um, uh, lecture. We will do, look at um, uh, classification of micrometeorites starting with a completely melted one and for each new image the peak temperature upon uh, atmospheric entry is supposed to be low. We start at 2000 degrees Celsius, hardly any metal left, metal has evaporated. We can see the remaining objects are glass ferro. They have, you can see they have some preserved um, gas vesicles inside. We don't know what they contain. We hope to do analysis uh, here uh, in November to find out the content of them in the Raman spectrometry. But these are small glass uh, uh, objects, glass from space. It's chondritic. The chemistry is in all the images you will see from now on is practically the same. It's only these are amorphous, not crystalline. But what happens if the temperature is slightly lower and uh, it might preserve some of the metal because most dust particles have a small ratio of metal, nickel iron, mainly some platinum. And uh, it's interesting to this, uh, consider um, cosmic spherule formation as a miniature uh, planet formation as the ratio between the metal as the metal core in earth and the mantle, the silicates, and the volatiles as the atmosphere is practically um, 
um, the same ratio. So, but what we see here, pushed forward to the front of the direction of speed is the remaining metal content of this uh, cosmic swirl. And as you can see around it, there is a small shade of something that's the beginning of a crystallization triggered by the metal. As the metal is cooling, it's triggering crystallization in the glass. And if this process continues, the crystallization, the crystalline area might grow. So it's covering uh, larger areas of the glass ferrule. You can see the one to the right, top right. It also has an opening at the back. Uh, actually, if this uh, strange information was not there, you would have seen there is also um, open vesicle at the lowermost uh, particle. This is where the degassing has occurred. So you can see that these uh, micrometrites are highly oriented objects. They have a distinct um, uh, orientation with a metal in the front kept by, uh, they're pushed forward in the movement uh, or in the direction of movement uh, by inertia during the deceleration. And at the opposite side, you have the degassing from the volatiles uh, creating open gas vesicles at the back. So it's a distribution of denser and less denser um, elements, elemental uh, distribution. So if this uh, process continues, we end up, I mean, if the, the um, uh, peak temperature was even slightly lower, the crystallization process triggered by the metal in the front might grow and finally cover the entire stone. So these are the cryptocrystalline um, type. Um, once again, I apologize for the for the strange line in the bottom. There are some information here, but it's um, these are the second of the distinct types uh, in the classification of micrometeorites, the cryptocrystalline micrometeorites. As you can see, they have metal beads in the front, but it has triggered a crystallization all around the object. These are small crystal balls from space. And the metal is usually, as we saw in the previous uh, image, is pre usually nickel iron. Um, nickel iron on Earth has mainly fallen into the core, as also these small metal beads uh, discovered by the backscatter SEM, the electron microscope uh, image here. They light up very, very much. They look uh, snow white on the gray uh, olivine, which some of you with experience from the electron microscope may recognize as very dense uh, elements. These are the, um, the platinum group uh, nuggets directly from a supernova close close to us in our cosmic neighborhood. And these objects, platinum, we can actually fall, find in the nearest roof. So, and if the temperature sinks a little bit more, uh, I will try to go, if you remember two images back from the cryptocrystalline micrometeorites, they had a very smooth surface. It was very smooth surfaces. Here, it's not smooth anymore. It's starting to get stripy. This is an intermediate stage be between the cri cryptocrystalline stage and the next uh, type, which is called the Barrett olivine. So what we see here, the slightly stripy surface are the olivine plate crystals starting to form inside the crystal domains of the micrometeorites. So they, they start slightly to get a stripy surface texture. And when that is uh, full blown, it will look like this. These are the barred olivine micrometeorites. These are the most frequently occurring type. Statistically, if we went out searching for micrometeorites on the roof here or out in the street, this is the first one, first type we will encounter. The stripy surface is also uh, easy to recognize. So this has been a great help for many new amateurs searching for micrometeorites because not only is this the first type you will encounter but it's also the 
perhaps the easiest one to recognize by the stripy surface texture. And also note the, the difference in orientation of the stripes. These are the different uh, crystalline um, bodies with each uh, distinct uh, orientation of the um, uh, crystallization. And if the peak temperature was slightly lower, we will get uh, not only the stripy surface texture, but these parallel olivine crystals, they will grow coarser. They will be larger and they will also start to cross each other. They are not anymore uh, parallel, but they will start crossing each other. These are the first sign of the next stage of the next type of micrometeorite, which is porphyritic uh, olivine. These are the large, largest uh, possible olivine crystals growing in uh, the Sferu. And as we can see here, there are no uh, stripy surface texture like before. It is a different type of stripe. It's the end termination of large olivine crystals. And the crystals are glued together in um, chondritic glass. So it's large olivine crystals in glass. And also note that there are some small metal beads uh, sprinkled over the surface. That, uh, that's the metal, the nickel iron metal. And uh, they are placed according to the laws of aerodynamism. And uh, it's uh, actually with experience, very quite easy to identify micrometeorites by their um, visual appearance and th that they are aerodynamic stones. But now we, the peak temperature is getting so low that they are gradually losing their aerodynamic properties. And this, uh, this is also a porphyritic olivine micrometeorite, but the temperature has been lower, the peak temperature during uh, uh, atmospheric entry. So what we see here is not, not anymore the large olivine crystals, but many, many small olivine crystals. And we can see open gas vesicles from degassing of the volatile elements. Might be carbon, might be water, might be sulfur, phosphorus. Um, degassing that is more or less completed in this lower heated part of the porphyritic olivine micrometeorites. But if they have been heated even less. Uh, there are these are no longer differentiated uh, micrometeorites. The elements uh, are much closer to how they were distributed in space, which means there are areas here you can see on the left one uh, of um, sulfide, iron sulfide. You can also see small um, shiny areas of of nickel iron not lumped together in large lumps, but small uh, small parts. These are getting closer to what micro cosmic dust particles look unmelted in space. Note also the black holes, because these black, the blackness of that hole, uh, the are remains of the organic molecules during degassing. De 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 so these uh, are not completely degassed, if we open them in a stem section, we might see interior uh, vesicles with intact um, organic molecules. And uh, here we are at the end of the range. Uh, we are getting down to the unmelted micrometeorites. They look dark. Uh, to my surprise, I search for unmelted micrometeorites uh, among the white part, light part particles for many years due to the, my experience with ordinary chondrites, very uh, pale interiors. But no, uh, that was a reminder once again, the micrometeorites are of a different population or different populations than the meteorites. They are not directly connected. So this uh, black small uh, organic molecule containing particles are the unmelted micrometeorites and they are in my view, even though they are not as beautiful as the glossy, colorful ones, they are the most interesting ones. 
they contain the full um, toolbox of protocells. Um, they contain, uh, we have thus far discovered, I think, more than 70 different organic components, uh, all the necessary uh, amino acids, lipids, sugar, um, so even water, and it is mentioned here, plus phosphorus necessary for a cell membrane, uh, nitrogen. So, of course, this is a new a candidate for contribution to how life began on Earth. We know now that the necessary components are still being delivered in the cosmic dust particles retrieved uh, on Earth. So if there is a, a connection, it's, it's up to you in the future, when in the future studies. But this is the, a very hot topic uh, in several uh, institutions at the moment to see if there are any connection between the cosmic dust and the fact that there is life on Earth. And if there is a connection, is this what the cosmic dust is doing? I mean, is this increasing the possibilities for finding life elsewhere in space? I don't know. Uh, anyway, these color uh, photos that you have now looked at are among the first ones uh, presented, uh, presented. And uh, in uh, already in 2009, when I mainly only found uh, contamination and industrial particles, I started photographing them and presenting them on my Facebook page. It's called Project Stardust because I was I felt quite alone doing this, I also felt very stupid because everybody said it's not possible. But I thought if if I establish this uh, scientific Facebook page, perhaps there are other people out there in the world who might um, join me and perhaps somebody somewhere could be in Catalonia and know more about cosmic dust and let's join forces so we can solve this mystery. But uh, no, um, <laughs> it didn't happen. On the other hand, in 2014, I was now 15, I was already finding micrometeorites. So I presented uh, my findings on the Facebook, Facebook page. And in the autumn of 2015, I was, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a strange place to publish uh, cutting edge science, I know. <laughs> but just watch today, even NASA does it. It's <laughs> Very soon, it's only scientists on Facebook, <laughs> no use anymore. Anyway, uh, in the autumn of 2015, I was contacted by some angry scientists from America. And they asked me, where is your peer-reviewed publication about this? And I said, mm -hmm, I don't have it, but I have uh, this and this uh, uh, documentation. And they say, mm -mm, no, this is not good enough. And they were right. They said, we have read all the um, uh, literature about micrometeorites, and this is not what they look like. And they are right, because in the literature, uh, they are white polished uh, objects from the electron microscope. And these, as you can see with colors, with tails, with crystallization, with metal beads and vesicles, they say, no, if you don't have a peer review uh, publication, you should not only take the photos away, and but you should also apologize for saying claim, claiming that these are micrometeorites. You cannot say that without uh, evidence. You can say it's what I really like, but not micrometeorites. I, was, uh, I didn't know what to do. So I contacted once again my mentor in London, Imperial College, my, uh, Matthew Genge, and said, uh, what, shall we, what, shall we, what can I do? And he said, there's only one thing to do. Pick out approximately 50 particles from your col collection, at that time around 500, and bring them to Natural History Museum in London, in the basements we will let them undergo the same protocol of analysis as we did 25 years ago when we uh, verified the uh, 
Antarctic uh, collection in 1995. So I did, I picked out uh, a collection and here it is uh, a pre the prepared uh, batch of, you see the small black dots on the resin, they are the candid candidates. At that moment they were, they could be anything. What we are going to find out is the moment of truth. Because the, um, uh, the microprobe analysis is much more precise than the electron microscope. I uh, had been working on for so long. So at last we would know. Um, and the, the process and the analysis is, uh, as some of you may know, is very time consuming. It takes one full week to uh, do the an analysis. And this is uh, Monday morning. And on Friday uh, afternoon, we suddenly got the first preliminary <laughs> results. And this is actually the very moment of truth. Uh, what we are looking at is the inserted photo. Uh, this is the um, uh, polished um, candidate, and the analysis show that it's absolutely congruent with the findings of uh, the Antarctic reference collection 25 years earlier. So this, in January uh, 2016, was the moment when it was clear beyond doubt that we not only had found micrometeorites, but we had found, discovered a method to find them. And it could actually be done by anyone, anywhere. So this will uh, continue perhaps in November with our citizen science here in Catalonia. We will see, I, I hope, I hope so. So who is in this picture uh, uh, apart from uh, the happy guy there? This is Matthew Genge with a cap. He is the uh, number one guy in micrometeoristics uh, uh, still. And this is his, at the moment, postdoc student um, who is now also becoming a very nice uh, scientist in the field of cosmic dust studies. So uh, when we published our findings, and this time, at last, a peer review <laughs> publication, um, it was published in uh, January of 2017. Then my life changed completely. Uh, the publication was called um, Urban Micrometeorites, No Longer a Myth. And uh, since then, it has been one of the most quoted uh, publications in geology um, areas. It has been, we, Matthew Genge and I stopped counting after 500 feature um, articles in newspapers and magazines from National Geographic to other, you know, New York Times, and, uh, Washington Post, everywhere, also in Spain, also in Catalonia. Uh, we made a notice about the discovery and uh, my life changed completely and it's still on that wave of uh, interest. So this opened up a new door for uh, finding material to study. So I, 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 re I received invitations to many places. This is the NASA's best laboratory in Johnson Space Center in Houston, led by uh, Michael Lensky. And what I'm looking at here is quite fantastic. It is, uh, I'm sure you know, uh, Joseph, it is the two large grains brought back to Earth from the Wilk 2 comet. And these particles, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's an achievement that took 25 years to come up with the idea of going out to a comet in flight, uh, get, catch some of the dust tail and bring it safe back to Earth for analysis in this fantastic laboratory. So I was, uh, I'm staring eternity into the eye. It's, just, uh, I get two people just by talking about it now. But <laughs> uh, as you know, uh, by this time, I had the habit of asking, uh, can I please also go up on the roof and search for <laughs> whatever you have? So here we are the next day up on the roof of the Stardust uh, uh, Laboratory. In the background, you can see the Rocket Park and the Lunar Lab is the neighbor building where they have all the uh, Apollo samples. I was uh, allowed to take uh, dust samples from both. 
And to the left here, you have NASA director Mike Zelensky and his um, electron microscope uh, assistant, uh, James Martinez. And then it's to the right with a cowboy hat. That's uh, John Keele, the photographer that I'm working with. So I'm standing with uh, blue rubber gloves, like Breaking Bad, with a small dust bag uh, scratched up from the area around the, the drain. And it so happened. It actually <laughs> contained five micrometeorites. So NASA, who had two uh, 300 micron uh, cosmic dust particles inside their laboratory, they had five of them on the roof. <laughs> and uh, some time later, also Uh, the irony of this, I will not comment. <laughs> but the, of course, we found them because the micrometeorites, the cosmic, they are everywhere. We could have searched wherever and we would could have found them. I visited the micrometeorite pioneer um, Michel Moret in uh, the northern, the French part of Catalonia in May. And uh, he is now a very old man. He discovered the micrometeorites in Antarctica. He went to the end of the world. And the day when I visited him, I took a sample from the, his doorstep and found one beautiful micrometeorite there. So it's, it's everywhere. So um, let me see. Uh, yeah, I also got a very, uh, thank you, Mike Zolensky, uh, um, statement from him that I had opened a new door to the beginning of the solar system. Uh, this is a um, statement I'm very especially fond of because what's interesting about a door is not the door itself. It's what's, be, what's behind it. What can we discover which is starting now? I have only opened the door and now other scientists will with a new access to new uh, research material, uh, do I'm certain of it, uh, lots of new studies, new analyses, and new findings. What we find, we don't know, but it's a new branch of science. Let me see. And if you, some of you perhaps have been wondering, uh, have there been found any micrometeorites in Catalonia before? And yes, these are from six years ago. I was uh, together with my two grown up daughters in Sitges. And uh, I went up to the parking lot uh, by the train station on the roof level and sampled the dust in the corners and found these two beautiful micrometeorites. Uh, to my knowledge, the first uh, Catalonian or Catalan micrometeorites. So I'm very happy. Perhaps. Um, Yesterday, uh, Joseph and I, we were up on the roof here and took samples, so uh, we will analyze it next week. So next week we will know if we had found any more. So that was uh, my uh, um, uh, my message for you, my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I understand. I understand that the front is bigger, so the heat is higher, and on the back, the technology, the practical, is lower. And so, 
I think I get your question. The question is, uh, how is the formation of the micrometeorites with the distribution uh, of the metal beads in the front, then you have the steel case, and then at the opposite side, you have the volatile elements. And uh, it has actually not really to do with the heat. It has to do with uh, earth, the, as it's, uh, the substance of Earth's atmosphere. When these um, dust particles arrive from space, they have a fantastic high uh, speed. Uh, hyperspeed is like 50 times the speed of a rifle bullet, uh, minimum 11 kilometers per second. And when they arrive into the atmosphere, they are so small, they have so small mass that they are instantly um, heated, flash heating by from the frictional heat. And, but they are also decelerated. The speed is falling dramatically because they are so small, the air molecules will slow them up. What happens in this moment of formation is that in a liquid state, when the particle has uh, reached the first air molecules, and are heated enough to melt, I mean, uh, reach more than uh, 1,350 degrees, let's say closer to 2,000, they melt, they become a liquid stone droplet, liquid droplet. But then in the continuation, the air molecules have enough resistance to decelerate, the speed is dropping. So what happens in the liquid state is a rapid uh, differentiation. It's like a planet formation in miniature, is that the, the metal is falling in, inwards to a core, and then the, you have the, the silicate, and then the evaporation of the volatiles. But as this, this is a liquid state, a um, liquid um, stone sphere, with a liquid metal uh, sphere inside. But with the continuous um, uh, friction towards air molecules, they are um, decelerated. The speed is breaking up and uh, this particle that has a very distinct uh, B-line in, um, or in um, uh, from space into Earth's atmosphere, uh, it will keep this uh, axis in the length direction due to the, and here comes the keyword, the um, uh, inertia of the denser molecules, the denser, the metal is pushed forward in the direction of speed due to the inertia. It's, uh, it's not decelerated as fast as the silicate, it's held back by the friction, but the metal is pushed in front into the front and held back uh, at the last second, last millisecond by the surface tension. So uh, it's a very rapid formation. It takes a blink of an eye and then it's all from, goes from a fluffy particle in space, uh, unmelted, uh, melting, differentiation, deceleration, inertia in the denser molecules, and then <coughs> voila. But at the same time, it could be more refractory. Absolutely. So you have a mostly volatilization of the front. Yes. So the glass only remains backward. Yes, and even the volatiles behind that again. Okay. So it's, uh, it's um, a distribution of the density of the elements due to inertia. You're very welcome. Thank you. And um, if you have a comment or a question, at some point when you show the uh, images of the micrometeorite based on the test, you know, from your human margin, I also saw that it was okay the same thing for me. Yes. And you said there's a lot of hypothesis that maybe they are responding or, you know, that maybe it's part of. But now that you explain that, uh, it, 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 it's a question. And, and I see that uh, there has to be some um, 
the mechanism actually quite the same, but it may be dangling the, the policy mission, but it cannot be. Because mm -hmm. you, I mean, otherwise, you, the only, that's what you said, the most interesting one is the uh, intermediate mechanism, because it's the most extreme, it's the one that didn't, you know, undergone this um, flat linear transformation. So then the hypothesis should be, you know, like it's not possible that they are part of funding or real funding. Well, uh, yeah, the question is the um, uh, what is the, the connection uh, between micrometeorites and chondrules? And in short, I think we can say that, uh, first of all, we don't know exactly the origin of the, um, the micrometeorites. So if you ask the British uh, scientists, they will say they are mainly from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. If you ask the American scientists, uh, NASA, etc. They will say they are mainly from outside uh, Neptune. They are cometary material. So I don't know. Maybe both, and even uh, there will be. So, but it's obvious that some of the mechanical dust from the asteroid belt will end up in the zodiacal cloud and will end up as micrometeorites. They will, however, not be preserved pristine unless they are unmelted. And they may also show up as we call them. Um, oh, what is it called in English? Um, relict grains mm -hmm. uh, inside. And what happens is in the um, in the melting and the recrystallization process of the micrometeorites, they are, uh, yeah, as the word says, recrystallized. It's not the same uh, con chondritic. Um, uh, Buried olivine, it's melted and it's crystallized, uh, crystallized again, recrystallized. And this time, the result is a much finer structure. In general, what, uh, from uh, I've studied much less chondrules than Joseph, of course, but I've in this, uh, investigated um, several chondrules, many actually, and they have the same textures, but they are much coarser. They are larger. They are the olivine crystals in Barrett olivine uh, chondrules are, to my experience, uh, much larger. And in a micrometeorite, when if you take a, a fragment of a um, uh, Barrett olivine chondrule, melt it, and let it suffer the same type of recrystallization, it might end up with uh, a Barrett olivine structure, <laughs> but in a much finer version. Yeah. So it's only with the, the relic grains, I think, or in the completely unmelted. The re relic grains are, of course, unmelted parts within the melted micrometeorite. But even in unmelted micrometeorites, there are uh, occasionally uh, fragments that look like uh, small parts of the uh, chondrules. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a very good statistical evidence on nuclear spectroscopy that relies small fragments to binary uh, ablation because, uh, as a consequence of volatiles, uh, some of these carbonaceous chondrites explode and then throw away the fragment away from the heat wave that is in the front. So there is a specific uh, probability to get this kind of chondrules that have been slightly melted, but not completely melted, like, uh, like this. And particularly, the carbonaceous chondrites of the CM group, C comes from carbonaceous and from the gate. CMs, the smaller chondrules in the carbonaceous groups. And the CM group of chondrites, uh, the Larger contributor to uh, implantation of materials in new planet. So uh, perhaps this is the because it's, there is a dominant flux of carbonaceous materials that are very fragile, much fragile than the ordinary condite, can contribute to this uh, dust, you know, because 
something survives. Something survives. Uh, <clears throat> Joseph has now explained um, about the CM type of uh, carbonaceous chondrites and the possible relation to the micrometeorites, which I think indeed is uh, a possibility. But we actually distinguish between the, uh, these objects would be called ablation spherules and not real micrometeorites. Micrometeorites are small in space per definition. I don't, I'm not sure if that is very significant, but it's nevertheless um, a definition. And have you ever found a um, Yes, uh, the, the question is, have you found other than the magnesium silicates? Uh, yes, the, uh, there are uh, the presentation of these six types uh, according to the temperature scale. This is the main part of the uh, meteorites, again, uh, micrometeorites. There are a couple of other types that doesn't fit into that system. Uh, there is uh, a particular one type uh, should be interesting for Catalans because it's called cat spherules. <laughs> and it's uh, enriched in calcium, aluminum, and titan. Yes, the kais. Uh, the one hypothesis is that it's exactly there they are found in the Antarctica, and they are uh, speculations uh, if there is a relation between the kais and the cat spherules. On the other side, you also have uh, pure uh, metal uh, micrometeorites, which of course are much more difficult to identify due to the vast uh, amount of industrial spherules that are iron oxides. Uh, there are, however, found three, <laughs> Three ones, uh, all uh, uh, identified thanks to small uh, specks of uh, platinum <laughs> on the surface. So they are the platinum group uh, nuggets, PGMs. But um, well, we are we are finding. I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. If the, you ask about the um, sulfid. Yes. 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 I don't know how that will uh, be when it. Yes. It should be, you see, uh, my da daily uh, work is at the SEM. Uh, I don't, I only get the weight percent um, distribution of the elements. So I don't get the... Uh, yeah. yeah. Area, no? I understand, but the um, no, I have not no, I have not observed that directly. But there are in the melted when they are melted, the this I would just only suppose that the um, elemental differentiation may uh, enrich the iron into the core, perhaps together with the other uh, parts of nickel. And become the the metal bead that we frequently observe on the surface of the micrometeorites. So it could be extracted out of it. You don't think so? Uh, I, I'm no, no, no. I, because I don't know. So you are probably right. Uh, which means my answer will be uh, no. I have not observed that. <laughs> Thank you. And professionals. One of those paid ones. Okay. <laughs> so, um, 
two years ago, um, I visited the warehouse pages saying, well, you can find the small micro rice in the rooms, etc. of melting the snow, etc. Actually, there was no method, no systematic way of distinguishing them from vision. So when uh, we started to post these things on Facebook, maybe the professional ones uh, are not following you or not believing you, but there were a few of us that for some reason Facebook suggested your web page run. And uh, actually, it was a pleasure to see this work progressing. Thank you. And then eventually published in a third review journal and so on. So I was one of the first writing your book with the signet in the first edition initially and so on. And it was so fantastic. And they are so beautiful. So, uh, so I don't know. If, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there are streaming anymore, but uh, it's, it's more a loose discussion about. Um, uh, the discovery of the methodology mm -hmm. and if the scientists paid attention or followed the Facebook page, they didn't, of course. At that time, you know, we are thinking uh, there has been a lot of change in the last 15 years mm -hmm. in outreach and the necessity of um, uh, being, as a scientist, not only be open to the press and to the public, but also to other branches of science. There may be some crossover um, learning from meeting other fields uh, in science. Um, yeah. I forgot your question, but it was about... No. Oh. Oh, that is obvious. You uh, you ask about why they were so reluctant about the method and uh, my research. It's, it's this is um, how science works. Uh, our uh, duty as scientists is to try to find uh, mistakes in other fellow scientists' work. That's we have to do that. It's, it's not to be a bad, bad person. It's how science works, because if we just confirm each other and if you will always find confirmation, there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's his name, um, uh, who said that any hypothesis, you will always find confirmation. So don't pay an attention to the confirmation. Look for the um, falsification. Because then you can, uh, that you can trust. A full bomb falsification is enough to uh, adjust your uh, direction of progress. But um, so I think uh, 15 years ago, there was a consensus in the scientific communities that this is not possible. And if you ask, uh, let's say, uh, science, science teachers in Norway or Spain, they would ask their university professors which would uh, turn to to NASA uh, directors and ask. And at the end, it's one person, it's Mike Zolensky, who had to, to answer. And he said, no, this is not possible. And that, that was the um, status of that uh, situation. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's how science works. Look 100 years back in time. They had explanations for everything like just like us but most of them were wrong uh, and if you consider today we think we know the explanations for how gravity works how to find micrometroids how uh, the implications of it all in 100 years it will be hybrids of us to not understand that most of our explanations today will turn out to be needed to be adjusted. Not necessarily completely wrong, but it will be wrong. So I think that's uh, the, the beauty of science. It makes us more open-minded. We always have to look for new possibilities, think outside the box. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.
So thank you. Um, I will leave uh, Catalonia now, and Joseph will be um, the contact. We hope to make some kind of workshop in the in November or something. Search for more material, do analysis together, involve uh, amateurs and scientists to participate. So perhaps see you then. Let's hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.